Okay, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you all for attending our online teaching session. This will be our uh, basically third session about ventilator uh, ventilation strategy. Uh, will be presented by our our uh, colleague here, Professor Dr. Ismail. Tafadhal Mashkura. Okay. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi So today, inshallah, we uh, will start our third class. Uh, we will continue the strategy from what we have taken in the first two classes. After that, uh, inshallah, we will proceed with the, the ventilator strategy. So uh, before we start, let's uh, read through the Fatiha. So uh, in the previous class we uh, we ended with the pulmonary mechanics, yeah, uh, compliance, elastance, resistance, surface tension, and the time constant. Now we will proceed with the mechanism of respiration. Mechanism of respiration. So the mechanism here, we have inspiration. And inspiration. Like we mentioned, inspiration is active. Inspiration is active process. Why expiration is Passive. So every process active or passive has four steps. So what happened during uh, normal respiration? Like we said, we have the respiratory center and we have voluntary control and involuntary control. So this respiratory center would be stimulated and would send signals to the respiratory muscles. Respiratory muscles. The main respiratory muscle is the diaphragm. Diaphragm, when diaphragm contract, it increases the vertical diameter. It is the most important vertical diameter of the thoracic cavity. Why the intercostal muscles? The external intercostal muscles will increase the lateral diameter and anteroposterior diameter. So again, contraction of diaphragm increase the vertical diameter. Contraction of external intercostal muscles will lead to increase lateral and anteroposterior diameter. And uh, if you remember, when we talk about pulmonary mechanics, we mentioned about compliance and elastance. And we said that there is desire or there is tendency for the thoracic cavity to expand because it is like spring. It is like spring. The thoracic cavity is like spring. The ribs around like spring. So there is tendency to expand. Opposite of the lung. The lung has tendency to recoil. So imagine one structure has tendency to recoil and one structure has tendency to expand. They are working opposite each other. They will create negative pressure, negative pressure inside the pleura. So always, always we have this negative pressure. So this is the rule. When you have two surfaces, like my hand is now, you see my hand is two surfaces. If we have two forces pulling them away, pulling them away, we will create negative pressure between my hands. If we have two forces pushing them in, we will have positive pressure inside. So in this case, between pleura and 
between the, the lungs and the thoracic wall, we have negative pressure already, which is inside the pleura. And this pressure becomes more negative. Normally, it is minus three. It will become minus six when we expand, when we expand the thoracic cavity. So expansion, expansion of thoracic cavity. This is number one. This expansion of thoracic cavity will increase, increase intrapleural pressure, intrapleural pressure towards the negative side. From minus three, it becomes minus six. So increase intrapleural pressure toward the negative side, or you can say decrease intrapleural pressure. If you don't want confusion, you can say decrease intrapleural pressure because it becomes more negative. And here you have to know what is the meaning of minus three and minus six. There is no unit because the, the, the consensus that zero, zero is 760 millimeter mercury. That is zero. That is zero. So when we say minus three, it is relative to this zero. <clears throat> so what will happen to the lung? The lung will expand. The lung will expand. There is tendency to recoil, but because of the initiation of expansion of the thoracic cavity, the lung will expand. Distension or expansion of the lung. Distension of lung. So when the lung distended, distended, what will happen to the intra-pulmonary pressure or intra-alveolar pressure? Intra-alveolar pressure will drop, decrease from zero, from zero, it will go to minus one. Minus one. So normally the pressure intra alveolar or intra pulmonary, normally it is zero at risk. With expansion of the thoracic cavity, which lead to distension of the lung, it becomes minus one. So after the pressure becomes minus one, we have the atmospheric pressure equal zero. So what will happen? The air will go in. Air. In. So that is the thing. Why the air goes in? Two things. First, the pressure of intra pulmonary becomes minus one, and the other thing is that the intra pleural pressure becomes here minus six. So the difference becomes more. The difference becomes more. See the difference. This is the difference. Initially, the difference is between zero and minus three. But now the difference is between minus six and minus one. So the difference here is three. Difference here is three. The difference here is five. So that's why we call it distending pressure. So how many pressures we have? We have intrapleural pressure, intrapleural pressure, Intrapleural pressure also is called intrathoracic. Intrathoracic. It's called intrathoracic pressure. The other pressure is intra alveolar. Alveolar pressure, which is called intrapulmonary. Intrapulmonary. The difference between them, the difference is called distending pressure. Distending pressure. Distending pressure. 
So that's why distending the difference D. Distending the ratio is difference. <clears throat> the other name for distending pressure is trans pulmonary pressure. Trans pulmonary. Trans pulmonary. So you can say distending pressure or trans pulmonary pressure. So these are the three main pressures involved in the inspiration process. Now, uh, if we go to the terminology, when we say intrapleural, it is same intrapleuracic. Do you think why? Why they call it intrapleuracic? <clears throat> because it is the same pressure transmitted to the thoracic structures. It is the same pressure transmitted to the esophagus. That's why the esophagus is kept better. Esophagus, even when we, do, we don't eat, the esophagus will be kept better because that intrapleural pressure is transmitted to it. And if they measure the intrapleural pressure, they insert the probe inside the esophagus. They insert the probe inside, they, they, they cannot insert the probe inside the pleura. They insert the probe inside the pleura, you'll get the pneumothorax. But they insert the probe inside the esophagus. And the pressure inside the esophagus will be the same pressure intrapleural. So intrapleural pressure is very important to be negative because it helps us in the respiration and it helps us in another thing. Who can tell me? I will ask the question. What else helps us the intrapleural pressure being negative other than respiration? Any other benefit? Open a question, anyone wants to tell? Repeat the question, repeat the question. The question that intrapleural pressure is negative, and the advantage of being negative is help us in the respiration. Like the inspiratory process will become more negative. Is it helpful for another physiological condition? Out of the respiratory system. Is it helpful for the cardiovascular system? Yes, I see the answer. Yeah, I see the answer. <laughs> the answer from Prof. Taufik is venous return. Yeah, so the intrapleural pressure being negative, it helps in the venous return also. That's the importance of intrapleural pressure. So intrapleural pressure, again, it is always being negative. Always negative becomes more negative during the inspiration process, and that's why we have also the venous return during that time. We have only positive intrapleural pressure in two conditions. Two conditions make intrapleural pressure positive. Number one is pneumothorax. Number two, valsalva maneuver. Yeah, so pneumothorax and valsalva maneuver make the intrapleural pressure positive. Otherwise, it is always negative. Let's go to that expiration. Expiration. So, in the expiration, here, after being, doing the expansion and the distinction and the more negative intraabdominal pressure and the air in, we will have recoil. Recoil. Or decrease expansion. Decrease expansion of thoracic cavity. So, with the, there's decreased expansion of the thoracic cavity, what will happen to the lung? So, the distension of the lung will disappear. There will be recoil, recoil of the lung. Recoil of the lung. So, what will happen to the pressure? The pressure now, the intra-alveolar pressure or intra pulmonary pressure, it will go to plus one. So it reached minus one here. Now it will go from minus one, go to zero, and go to plus one. And then the air will go out. So 
we can see this is the expiration process, which is passive process. So let's draw the, the physiology of the respiration. Let's draw. So this area is the pressure. Down is the pressure. And up is the volume. So we have zero pressure here, zero pressure. So this line, this line is intraalveolar pressure or intrapulmonary intraalveolar pressure intraalveolar pressure so it will go to minus one here and plus one here so this part is inspiration inspiration and this bar is expiration <clears throat> so if we take that intrapleural pressure we have minus three here Minus three here, same thing. So the intrapleural pressure becomes more, more, more negative until minus six here. Minus six. Then in the expiration, it will go back to minus three. So this is the pressure. If we look at the volume, it is the opposite. The volume, so that will increase, will go here in the expiration and will go down during expiration. So you notice the fluctuation of the pressure. The fluctuation of the pressure here, it goes to minus one during middle of inspiration. It goes to plus one during middle of expiration. This is the intra-alveolar pressure. Intra-pleural pressure is lowest at the end of inspiration and highest at end of expiration and beginning of inspiration. And the distending pressure, distending pressure, difference which may distance when it is more, the highest distending pressure, the highest volume. We can see here from zero to minus six, so the distending pressure is six. So we have that highest volume here. This is the physiology normal respiration. Is it clear? Okay, so you can review the video after that. And if any questions, you can send to the group. Now I will put the definition of the dead space. <clears throat> dead space by definition, it is the air volume which 
does not undergo gas exchange. Gas exchange. That is the dead space. So the dead space is classified into mechanical mechanical dead space and physiological dead space physiological dead space so a question today was what is the mechanical dead space yes and pause what is the mechanical dead space see the definition So, mechanical dead space. Okay. Mechanical dead space is the volume in ET tube and ventilator cell. This is mechanical. So, the volume of the ventilator tube and the ventilator cell. That's why. I think one time, uh, if not mistaken, Dr. Sayyid Abdul Khalid did it. You, you, you saw after intubation what Dr. Sayyid uh, Abdul Khalid did, he cut the endotracheal tube. So that's the aim of cutting endotracheal tube, especially uh, if premature babies, because the dead space is significant. Yeah, we'll, we will tell later. Small babies have higher dead space already. So it, it is beneficial when you cut that into tracheal tube, so you reduce the amount of the mechanical dead space. Physiological dead space is classified into anatomical and alveolar. Anatomical and alveolar. So, anatomical is the airways, airways without alveolar. Airways without alveoli. Alveolar are alveoli with poor perfusion. Poor perfusion. So this is the dead space. So the airways without alveoli include trachea, major bronchi, segmental bronchi, bronchioles, terminal bronchioles. Yeah. Trachea, major bronchi, segmental bronchi, bronchioles, terminal bronchioles. When we come to respiratory bronchioles, there are some alveoli. So all that area is anatomical dead space. Alveolar, like when we have certain problem, like when we have poor perfusion, like for example, uh, patients with heart failure or patients with post cardiac surgery or those who have pulmonary embolism, they may get some alveoli which are distended already, can receive the oxygen, but they have poor perfusion. So they are considered as alveolar the space. Now, why? Why I will I will say why the space is more in infants, and this is important when we come to the ventilator strategy later. You see, now if I ask you one question, if I take the ratio of the head, the ratio of the head to the chest, do you think the ratio of the head is bigger in a newborn or less? What do you think? Just imagine. So you see the ratio of the head is bigger, is bigger in the in the newborn. And this head also has the, the space. The pharynx is 
did the space. We call it extra thoracic, extra thoracic did the space. So small babies, they have already did the space, extra thoracic. So if we come to extra thoracic did the space, extra thoracic did the space, In the newborn, it is 2.3, 2.3 ml per kg. That is in the newborn. In older children and adults, older children and adults, it is only 0 0.8 ml per kg. That is the extra truck. So much higher than the newborn. Much higher than the newborn. That is the extra thoracic. The intra thoracic is the same. The intra thoracic did the space is one boy zero three ml per kg. It is not different between newborns and older children. What is the problem of the dead space? The dead space will lead to ventilation perfusion mismatch. VQ mismatch. VQ mismatch. This VQ mismatch can lead to hypoxia. Hypoxia and hypercapnia. When we have VQ mismatch or ventilation perfusion mismatch. Clear. So this is the the space, and like we said, the space can lead to VQ mismatch or ventilation perfusion mismatch. Now I will ask one question. So question open to all. What is the other cause of VQ mismatch other than the space? Is there another cause for VQ mismatch? So other than the space, we have shunt, intrapulmonary shunt. So we have VQ mismatch, VQ mismatch, VQ mismatch. We have either the space, like we mentioned it, the space, or we have intrapulmonary shunt, intra. Pulmonary shunt. What is intrapulmonary shunt? It is the same thing when we, we, we mention shunt in the heart. What will you understand? You will understand the most common is right to lift shunt and which will make the patient cyanotic. Right to lift shunt, like for example, when you have uh, uh, VSD in case of tetralogy of fallot with bidirectional shunt, or you have Eisenmenger with reversed shunt. So, right to lift shunt and makes the patient to blue. Here it is also right to lift shunt, but it is not at the heart. It is not at the heart. It is at the alveolar level. You see, we have the alveolus here. This is the alveolus. And we have the pulmonary capillary. So the pulmonary capillary will bring the blood here. The blood will come inside the pulmonary capillary. So the blood will send CO2 out by diffusion and oxygen will come in. And then the oxygen will continue in the circulation. So this is the normal. If this cannot happen, 
it will be shunk. If the oxygen cannot come here, it will be shunk. So in the shunk, we will have alveoli with poor ventilation, like this alveolus. So this is the standard alveolus, good, but this alveolus has poor ventilation. This is the alveolus here. So when the blood comes, when the blood comes, so CO2 cannot go out. CO2 cannot go out. And oxygen cannot come in. Oxygen cannot come in because of the shunt. Because of the shunt. Yeah. Alveolus is not well distant. Now, high level question. Yeah, question two. Intensivist. Yeah. Question two. Intensivist. But okay, let's uh, uh, give the question over to you. Let you think. Now, how to differentiate? If you have one patient with hypoxia and hypercapnia, and you think it may be that the space or shunt. How to differentiate by test? Any test you can do to differentiate between shun and the space. Okay, anyone wants to think? So the answer is to differentiate between the space and shun, I have to check in tidal CO2. I check in tidal CO2. In tidal CO2 which is available in the ventilators. The ventilators, they have one uh, probe which is connected to the endotracheal tube. Let's say this is the ATT endotracheal tube. So the entire CO2 is connected here. This is the entire CO2. Entire CO2. Then it will be seen in the ventilator screen. You'll see the number here. Like you see the SpO2 and the respiratory rate and the heart rate, you see the entire CO2 here. So it is on probe. It is a probe connected to the endotracheal tube. So the entire CO2 is the CO2 level here. Is the CO2 level here? So we can check that entire CO2 here and we check that P A CO2 by blood gas by ABG by ABG. So, and then we take that gradient. We take gradient. Gradient. What should we call it? Arterial. Arterial. Alveolar. CO2. Gradient. So this gradient, normally it is only two. Normally it is only two. Okay, so fine. Yes? You only have three more minutes, but I already shared the link for the next. We, we, we just changed to another, another invite ID. Okay, sure, sure. Yeah. yeah. So if we finish this point, then uh, if any questions after that, we go to the other link. So the normal arterial alveolar CO2 grade is two millimeters. Mercury. This gradient will not change in one condition and will change in another condition. So now can, you, can I let you think, tell me which one will make the gradient high? Is it the, the space or the shunt? So start thinking in your mind. Is the question clear? Okay, I repeat the question. So we have VQ mismatch, it is either reduced in the space or intrapulmonary shunt. Both of them will cause hypoxia and hypercapnia. To differentiate between them, we need to check arterial and ulnar CO2 gradient, the difference between PACO2 and ABG and the entitled CO2. In one condition of them, it will not change. While in another condition, it will change. 
So start thinking which one will make it to grow longer. The dead space. The dead space will make the gradient problem. I'll show you how. I hope that three minutes are enough. So let's say here I have this one has shunt. So, and I have the blood here. So, I have the CO2, CO2, in inspired blood, inspired blood, 0.1 basin. Why CO2? In exhaled blood, 0.1. 